If you're watching online with us, we want to invite you to sing. Come on. I was searching for something, something I knew was there but couldn't see. Searching for the
Welcome to Central Church, a place where it is okay to not be okay. If you're just joining us, my name is Pastor Nick. We want to say thank you so much for being a part of our online family. You're more than just a face behind a screen to us. You've got a name, you've got a story, and we want to get to know you and your story. So in the comment section below, make sure to put your name, where you're watching from, so that one of our hosts can start chatting with you and engaging with you and start a relationship with you right here in this church. And also for our online family, we have an incredible weekend coming up on September 10th and 11th. We have a tailgate weekend where the NFL is kicking off here in the States and we're gonna be kicking off a brand new ministry season as well and celebrating it with the tailgate. Now here's how we're gonna make it a lot of fun for the online family. Besides all the fun we're gonna have in the experience that weekend is that if you host a watch party, which you might be saying, what's a watch party? That's anytime you have friends and neighbors and coworkers or whoever over to your house to experience church with you or to watch church together. And if you take a picture of that watch party or a video of that watch party this weekend, this week, next weekend, and you tag Central Online on Facebook or Instagram, you can even send us an email if you don't use social media to info at centralonline.tv of that watch party. But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna choose three of you and we're gonna provide a tailgate experience for you on September 11th, 9th, uh, 10th and 11th. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Make sure to tag us so that we can help you win and provide that tailgate experience. Well, here at Central, we also have a website that's a great tool to help connect you during the week, answer any questions you have. Make sure to check it out. You can go to centralchurch.online to see it, but here's a video to set it up. Awesome, awesome. Hey, help me welcome my friend, Kristen, this weekend, will you? I can't wait for you to hear her story. Kristen and her husband, they've been married now 20 years, yeah. And uh, 13 years ago, they found themselves moving to Las Vegas from Illinois. She's an Illinois girl. I knew we had kindred spirits because I'm an Illinois boy. And they moved here and they had a recommendation to go to a church called Central. And uh, so after they moved, they said, let's go check it out. They came through the doors. And this has really been home ever since that moment for you. And she had needed a community around her being like from, moved from home and kind of in a new city. So she joined a women's group and, and that became her community. And there she, she looked for ways to express her faith through generosity and serving. And she got involved and served the city. She was part of our edge of commitment team that, that helped people discover how to best date and discover if, if they're right for each other and ultimately to be married. But it was the Serve the City team that really grabbed Kristen's heart. She was in our food pantry long before the pandemic. But when the pandemic hit, obviously, she became a vital part of Hope for the City and began to even be a site lead over, over one of our, our uh, food pantries. And I want you to know this weekend, you're meeting one of the heroes that has been greatly used by God almost almost like tirelessly. I, in fact, there was one time I was at one of our pantries and there's Kristen and I showed up another. There's Kristen and then I go to this. There's Kristen. I'm like, Kristen, do you live at the church? You're like, are you always serving? And she was just in it to win it because her heart was to provide hope and assure not a single person in our city would go hungry. And she saw the needs and said, I'm going to make something about it. Yeah. It's really remarkable, really remarkable. When did generosity like that take hold in your heart? Because it's been very inspiring, especially for me. So when 
the church started the Generosity Rockstar. I had seen generosity through my life and it didn't click between giving to the church and what it was doing for the church. <clears throat> so Generosity Rockstar, it's the $20 a week. I'm like, oh, we could do that. At the time, my husband didn't have the greatest job, but I figured $20 a week, we could do it. So we did that and then he got a better job and he's been doing that job for the last six years and he's had pay increases. So with the pay increases, we increased our generosity and then he'd get another pay increase, we'd increase our generosity. So him and I finally realized, hey, the more we give, the more he gives for us to give. So now we're the generosity rock star, we tithe and um, I just see the blessings throughout the week and not just the pantry, but CR and um, Hope for Kids, <laughs> I see where that generosity helps a lot of people and not just certain people. Yeah, that's beautiful. And God is using the generosity of the central family to impact so many lives. And I know you've been a benefactor of expressing generosity. Tell us about that. So last year, Hope for Kids, I had a number in mind and God said, no, I want this number. And we had a debate. God won. <laughs> so, and it was only because of something that happened prior to that, that we were able to actually um, help more kids than we thought we could. And it was all about the generosity. And it's beautiful. And I know so many people have been helped and inspired by your generosity, by your time, talent, and financial resources that you pour out for them. Kristen, thank you. You're one of heaven's heroes. And I hope you feel blessed this weekend. Come on, church. Thank you. Well, I can't say it any better. That's beautiful. I think that's what God desires from all of our lives, that we would be a living expression of his love, a reflection of what he's done in our lives. And that's what Kristen's doing. And that's what we desire for every person that calls Central Home. And so we want to encourage as we kick off a brand new ministry season to just pray that through. Maybe you heard her say something about Generosity Rockstar. You'd like to learn more about it. Our team will be in the lobby. They'd love to talk to you about that. Maybe you'd like to learn how you can plug in with helping others. Our team would love to talk to you about that. Maybe you'd like to make a financial gift this weekend. It's easy to do. Just go to central.family or centralchurch.online or team will be in the lobby wearing a red apron. They can help you make a gift by credit or debit card, or you can give by check or cash. But here's what I want you to know. Your generosity is allowing Central, giving Central the ability to impact lives. Many times, many of these lives have come to faith and named Jesus the leader and forgiver of their life, church. You are awesome and you're making a big impact. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. It matters. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Will you join me? Well, Jesus, our hearts are just full of gratitude. Many times, Father, it's just hard to think of all the things that you've provided for us, but you've been so good. You're a good God. You give us so many good things. In fact, you promise that every good and perfect gift that we have comes from you. So I pray today we would just stop and look around all of what you've done for us and our hearts would be full of thanksgiving and gratitude for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you want to do for us. Jesus, right now, we invite you into this time where we lift your name on high. We pray that you would just flood our lives with your goodness, with your love, with your presence, and with your mercy. And may we experience grace today, a new start as we worship you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. stand and continue to sing. My eyes, my eyes, I turn into your face. My heart, my heart is filling up with faith. Though I'm in the tension, facing a million questions, you have my attention. See? 
kids had the opportunity to go to our, our kids and our youth camp. And I won't forget the moment I picked Lola up off the bus. She got in the car and she said, Dad, my group leader, Kyla, has been challenging each and every one of us to take a next step. She said, here's what I wanna do. I wanna read God's word daily. I wanna pray. I wanna make sure I'm in church every weekend. I wanna keep turning my eyes to Jesus. And there's nothing better, there's nothing better as a father, to watch your kids take spiritual steps themselves. In fact, last week, and we were in the car, and she's just downloading all the notes from Pastor Judd's message and her, her group time in Central Youth. I'm so thankful for our youth and our kids' leaders that serve every week in here. 
I'm also grateful for all of our teachers and our community and our professors. And I, I want to say a prayer, especially for you this year, that God would protect you and use you in a powerful way. Thank you for what you do in our kids' lives. And if you're here today, and yeah, you can give it up for them. If you're here today and you need prayer, whatever you're faced with in your life, I want to take a moment and pray for you. If I can just say a simple prayer for your situation, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air? And if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I want to encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray and ask God to do what only he can do. Would you join me? God, right now, we lift up our friends to you. Lord, in this moment, we turn our eyes and our attention and our focus on you, the author of life, the one who's in control of the future. And Lord, we just let go and we trust that you're going to do the impossible in our lives. Lord, give us a sense of your hope and your peace your grace today. I also lift up all of our teachers, our professors, our youth and kids leaders who just pour out daily into our kids' lives. I pray that this school year, you would just bless them tremendously. Do a work in and through them. Keep them safe. Keep our kids safe. Thank you so much for, for them and what they do for our community. For it's in your name we pray. And everybody said together. together for thine is the kingdom come on for thine is the kingdom the power the glory forever and ever and ever and ever for thine is the kingdom the power the glory forever and ever and ever and ever
church today. You can be seated. Amen. Amen. What a powerful, powerful moment of worship. Thank you all so much for worshiping with us. And shout out to those central locations, especially that Sunrise lo location. Shout out to you guys. Also, shout out to those of you who are watching and joining us online. Alice from Hawaii, Josiah and Georgia watching from Hawaii as well, Christy from Texas, Ruth from Seattle, Washington, Johnny from Anchorage, Alaska, and Rhonda from South Dakota. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We also want to welcome everyone watching from our prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars and the Pando app. So thankful that you're a part of the Central family as well. And at this time, we're going to continue in this incredible series that we've been in. So we're going to welcome Pastor Judd to the stage as he shares with us a message on how to follow Jesus better. Good to see you guys. Welcome, everybody. I hope you had a good week this week. And uh, I don't know uh, how many of you are old enough to remember a thing called commercials. And um, I, I don't mean like these like YouTube commercial things where you can skip after like five seconds. I mean old school, pre-DVR commercials where you had to sit and watch. I mean, the only time I really see commercials anymore today is like watching the Super Bowl with friends, right? That's the only live TV thing I think I have going on in my life. But, um, you know, like I can remember when my kids were little back in the day and we, we'd have a DVR, we'd record cartoons and stuff. But I can remember one day they're sitting there and the DVR switches to live programming. And suddenly this commercial comes on the air. And it's for a particular product that was called Floam. Does anybody remember Floam? These are these little like styrofoam pellets that you can use mixed with water to make all kinds of things, sandcastles and, and uh, you know, um, uh, dinosaurs, bike seats, all these things. And so the commercial are quick cuts and all these kids that are happy and like running through the fields to the sound of music, you know, like, like everybody's like living their their best life and and all you need is phloem to make that happen and then the announcer comes on and says hey for just like you know a certain time if you can if you jump in right now you know you can get double the amount of phloem for even less money and I remember when this commercial was over my kids are sitting there and my son who was totally content 30 seconds before <laughs> says we have to have that. <laughs> and, and his sister jumps in. Dad, we, we need phloem. We've got to have phloem. Dad, can we please get phloem? Dad, and I, if, if we get phloem, we'll be the perfect children. We, 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 we'll never complain. We'll do all of our chores. Well, if we could just have phloem. Dad, our life will not be complete without phloem. It's like a phloem-shaped hole opened in their heart. <laughs> Only phloem could fill the void. And I remember saying something to them like, well, you've got money from like Christmases and birthdays and in-laws giving you gifts. I said, Why don't you get your money together and I'll make sure to, we'll get some phloem. And apparently phloem was only worth my money, <laughs> right? It wasn't really worth their money. But I think about that story because even as adults, we have the same tendencies. We tend to look around and think the next purchase or the next experience or the next accomplishment is what will fill the hole inside. We tend to look around and think, man, if we can just get to get one more thing, one more kind of notch, then it will lead to a greater life. And when you think about it, so many of the experiences and decisions that you and I make and have really go back to this subconscious or conscious desire to experience a greater life, a better life. And sometimes it can lead to a lot of frustration because you purchase that thing, you go on that trip, you have that experience, you reach that accomplishment, and it's awesome, but it's not enough, right? It doesn't really fill the hole in your heart and in your life. Sometimes we can find ourselves even in a place of frustration by making all these decisions, and then it leads us to a place of darkness. I mean, nobody ends up 
or nobody hopes that they're going to end up in a place where their marriage is struggling. Nobody hopes to end up in a place where they have so much debt over their heads that they're not sure how they're going to get out of it, right? Like, like nobody plans on being at a place where you're alienated from friends or family members. Nobody thought they would get in the particular place they may be in with work, but, but, but there many of us are. And I think the good news today is we've made all these choices to try and get to a greater life. And in the end, they're frustrating and it doesn't fill the hole because as an adult, y'all, it's not a phloem-shaped hole. It's a God-shaped hole. And only God can fill what we keep trying to cram everything else in to fill our hearts. And so today I want to look with you at the teaching of Jesus, because Jesus comes along and says, I've come to bring you life and give you life to the full, a rich and satisfying life. And we're going to see today that Jesus is the light that can lead to a greater life, the greater life we're all searching for in our lives. We've been in this teaching series called Follow Him. We've been looking at how uh, Jesus comes up to different individuals in his life and ministry and says these two like super powerful words. He just, he invites them into a journey and he says, follow me. And today I want to go to John chapter eight and look at a time that, that Jesus spoke these words, not so much to an individual, but to a crowd of people. So we're going to bring the scripture here up on the screens. And as we get to the red word, as I'm reading it, I'm just going to ask you to, to red words, say them out loud here with me. It's how we make sure everybody's awake. And uh, so here we go. It says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you what? If you follow me, he says, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You will have the light that leads to life. How many of you wouldn't mind having a little more light in your life right now? A little less darkness, a little less frustration, a little less despair, a little more joy, a little more peace, a little more of God moving and working in your life. Listen, the next purchase isn't going to get you there. The next experience isn't going to get you there. It's not going to fill that place in your life. But Jesus says, if you follow me, I am the light that leads to life. And so if you follow me, I can lead you to the thing that you really hope for and desire in your life. Because whether you realize it or not, only God is really going to be able to fill that space in our lives. So I want to look with you today at a couple ideas that can help us follow Jesus as the light that leads to life. And the first is this, to step back from judgment, to step back from judgment. So uh, two weeks ago, uh, Lori and I, my wife, we took our little eight-month-old puppy, Stella, to obedience training. Come on, somebody. <laughs> obedience training. Because that dog's got big ears, and she does what she wants to. She doesn't listen well. So we took her to obedience training. Uh, actually, I missed the first week. But the whole idea was, like, they do the training with the dog on basic commands, and then at the end of that... Um, you know, they train the owners, right, on how to, how to train the dog. So I missed the first week. So Lori come ho comes home and she just, you know, we're, we're going to do this dog training session, right? So we're trying to get our little dog to learn what place is so she'll stay on her, her little bed. So we get the bed set up and, and all of this. And, and the idea is like, you know, we put her on the bed and then we kind of slowly walk away and then we sort of ignore her and let go of the leash. And, and we're over here chilling out and she's just hanging out on her bed. Okay. That's the idea, but Lori goes into executive coach boss mode because she was at the training. And I'm telling you, every single thing I did, no, Judd, you can't, you can't say stay. I put Stella, I'm like, stay. She's like, you can't say stay. You can't do hand motions. You know, every single thing I did, Lori, and finally I said, will you stop judging my dog training skills? And she says, I'm not judging you. Isn't it interesting? You can't always tell when you're judging someone else, but you can always tell when they're judging you. Come on, somebody. I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, you are. 
And at one point, I'm like, just leave the room. I got it. And as soon as she left the room, I bent down and said, Stella, stay. Here, have a treat. And I said to her, we do what we want to. That's how it rolls. When she's left the room, we do what we want to. Um, it's easy when... It's easy to know when you feel like you're being judged by somebody else, even if they have the best intentions. Now, what's interesting in Jesus' comment in John chapter 8 is he says he's the light of the world. We can follow him. He's the light that leads to life. And then the story right before that almost illustrates what Jesus has just said. The story right before it is the story of a woman brought before Jesus who's been caught in the act of adultery. And... Um, to set the stage, Jesus is talking at the temple. It's early in the morning. All of a sudden, the religious leaders kind of show up and crash in on his teaching, and they've got stones in their hands, and they've got this woman that they say was caught in the act of adultery, and they say the law of Moses in the Old Testament says that she should be stoned. She was caught in the act of adultery, and they say, what do you say, Jesus? which there's a lot that's kind of fishy here. Like, first of all, why are they bringing her to Jesus? He's not like an official. He's, he's, a, just, he's a religious teacher. Like, like he doesn't act in an official capacity here. Secondly, like, where's the guy? I mean, it takes two to tango last time I checked, right? Where, where's the guy, right? And there's a lot of dynamics here. And John gives us insight, the gospel writer, he says they were trying to trick Jesus. That was the, it was a setup. They bring this woman, man, they got her, they got anger in their hearts, they got all these dynamics going on, they've got rocks in their hands, and they say, what do you think, Jesus? And they want to set him up in like a catch-22 where he can't win. If Jesus says, well, you know, you should show mercy to her, well, he's already got a reputation as a friend of tax collectors and disreputable sinners, so this will just give them more ammo to spread that Jesus is almost amoral in his approach, right? He, he, you know, he doesn't care about what you do or how you live. Or if he comes in and says, no, no, you should follow the law and stone her. Well, that raises all kinds of other issues. All the people that thought Jesus was merciful now are like in shock. And then you have this whole problem that only the Romans can actually execute somebody at that time. So now he, he gets in trouble with the Roman authorities, which was their plan all along. So, so they're trying to set him up. So they bring this woman. They've got no compassion for her. They've got no sort of sense of how much they're embarrassing her or humiliating her. They bring her in the morning, which is kind of weird. Hey, look, we caught her having adultery in the morning. Okay. And they've got anger in their hearts. And Jesus wisely doesn't engage them. He, he kneels down and begins to write in the dirt. But I think this is a powerful story because it illustrates two kinds of darkness. On the one hand, there's the darkness that the woman's experiencing through her own sins and choices. You know, the darkness of the affair. But on the other hand, there's the darkness of the religious leaders, right? Who are all like wound up with stones in their hands, ready to cast judgment on this poor woman. Two kinds of darkness. And I think both of them can profoundly affect our lives in negative ways. And it's after this story, Jesus says, I'm the light that leads to life. Follow me. Have you noticed these religious leaders got so judgmental? It's so easy to get judgmental. Anybody else relate to this? Like, like they take something really simple, like just a diet, like whatever you eat. Let's say you get on a special diet. You're going to do low carb or low fat or, I don't know, extra cheese, keto, uh, vegan, vegetarian, all chocolate, whatever it is, whatever your diet is. You're eating your diet and, and you're on it for our health reasons or whatever. And you, Have you ever done this? You start feeling better. You start losing weight. You're working out. You're kind of, you're in great shape and you're just, you're killing it. And then you go to a restaurant with a bunch of friends or extended family. And have you ever looked around and because you're doing so good in that moment, you're kind of like, man, I can't believe these people eat this crap. <laughs> you know, you're just looking around like, wow, I can't believe you're putting that in your face. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You ever looked at somebody and thought in your mind, man, you might want to push back from the table unless you want high blood pressure, bro. Like, you eating that dessert for? And it's amazing how 
three months ago, that was you. But now you've been working out. You're keto, non-whatever, triple whatever. And you got it dialed in for a moment. Fast forward three more months and it might be another story. Anybody know what I'm talking about right there? But in the moment, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm doing really good. And you start looking at people around you and, and it's easy to just get judgmental. And it can happen not only with simple things like diet, it can happen in the spiritual life as well. Let me put a little chart up here for you. Don't worry, we're not going back to math class, okay? But this is just a spiritual growth chart. And, and here's the idea. We're gonna start over here at negative five. Negative five is kind of as far from God as you can possibly get in your spiritual life. And um, if zero is where you come to faith in Christ and begin to trust him in your life, and then plus five over here is like, being super spiritually mature like the Apostle Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament of the Bible, okay? So, so I want you to just sort of imagine, uh, you know, we're all at different places on the spiritual journey, but before we come to faith in Christ, um, you know, we're gonna be in varying places over here of what we might describe as far from God or living for ourselves or living in a self-destructive way. Like, it's gonna be different for all of us. Some people are just like right here and then they come to Christ and then others like me are like, over here, and it's a journey, right? But the good news is, once we come to faith in Christ, he, he begins to transform our lives. You can't help but be changed. Here's what will start to happen in your life. All of a sudden, you're gonna start to care more about not only God, but the needs of other people. You're gonna become less selfish. You're gonna start to realize there's some stuff in your life that you need to forgive and let go of. There's some bitterness that you've been carrying. You're gonna be impacted by the generosity of God's people and their, the way they serve others and the challenge to be giving of ourselves for others, and that's going to change you for the better. You're going to eventually start to handle money with a little more responsibility. You're going to get more intentional and disciplined about how you move forward in your life. You're going to start to walk in the light as Jesus is the light. And what happens is your life starts to get better. Not perfect, but better things start to move forward. And here's what I've seen over time, particularly for young believers. I'm going to say people that come to faith in Christ and have been believers for, let's say, around two or three years to about five years. There's a window there where God has done a tremendous work in their life and they're growing. And their temptation now is to look back at all of these people doing all the things that they were doing just three years ago and get all judgy towards them. I can't believe y'all do that. Can't believe you go there. Can't believe you party like that. Can't believe you still say those things. I can't, you know, like, I can't believe these people <laughs> that are just like you people two years ago. But now you know enough to be dangerous. Come on, somebody. You've been to some Bible studies. You might have jumped into Central Academy. You've taken a class. And it's easy to start thinking like, well, I got it going on. I know what's happening. And to start looking down at others. You know, whole church communities can begin to move down this scale of spiritual growth. And as they get closer and closer to God, they get further and further away from the needs of people who have yet to come to know Christ and trust him in their lives. And they just create a holy huddle down here, you know, like everybody's already on the team and we're all going to huddle up and talk about how great of a team we're on. But they're not looking back anymore, trying to rescue people who are just where we were a few years ago. And I just want you to know at Central, we are committed to growing spiritually. And we've got tremendous resources from a leadership pipeline to ministry opportunities, internships to uh, Central Academy to help people grow spiritually. But it's never just to get more knowledge. It's always in service of looking back to those who may be far from God or hurting and helping them 
them come to the same Christ that we've come to and experience his love and forgiveness. These religious leaders that bring this woman before Jesus, they feel like they've moved down the continuum of spiritual growth and now they're looking back in judgment on other people and they're so frustrated and they're trying to call Jesus out in this moment and they won't relent. And so here's what we read in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. John 8, 7, it says, they kept demanding an answer. So he, Jesus, stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has what? Never sinned throw the first stone. Okay, that's what you call a mic drop moment. You know, that's a mic drop moment, right? Right there. And just, you may have heard that before, but don't forget how insightful of a statement that is in the moment, just because you might have heard it before over 2,000 years of history. Jesus is like, all right, sure. In one statement, he both affirms their idea of the law and challenges them to be merciful. And he says, whoever wants to fire away, fire away. If you've never sinned, you could throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. We don't know what he wrote in the dust. Scholars have debated that. Some have said maybe he wrote uh, the names of uh, people the religious leaders once had inappropriate relationships with. <laughs> that would be awkward. <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we don't know. Nobody, nobody knows. But whatever he wrote in the dirt... By the way, it's the only time Jesus is mentioned to actually write. So is right here. So by the way, that's now you have that cool piece of trivia. You can like be hanging out this week, be like, hey man, do you know that there's only one place in the Bible where it says Jesus wrote? Yeah. Yeah, John. <laughs> Gospel. <laughs> you look really smart. Anyway. He's writing in the dust. And then the Bible says that there's a pause, at least how I see it, and that starting with the older and moving towards the younger, they begin to drop their rocks and walk away. And starting with the older, I think, because they've had a little more time to fail and make mistakes and to realize they're not the ones without sin who can fire away and then and then moving to the younger who are all like passion and fire except the older people, their cover just left. So they drop their rocks and eventually walk away. And it's a powerful reminder to all of us. The only one who could have thrown the stone who was without sin was Jesus and he didn't. Our calling isn't to judge other people all the time for everything. Some people make this a religious, like they're professional religious judgers. And that's a pathway to misery. It's a pathway that I believe leads to stumbling in a certain kind of darkness. You'd be saved, you may follow God, you may believe in Jesus, but you're in your own darkness as you look around and judge everybody else for where they're at in their life. And there's not joy there. Instead, you should look to Jesus and just be encouraged by all that he's done in your life and pray that God will do the same in their life and model from them, for them how you live, point the way that they could begin follow Jesus and grow in him. You know, the most righteous people use the truth to build others up rather than to tear them down. That's the kind of faith community we want to be at Central. We want to use God's word. We want to use the truth to build other people up rather than to tear them down. We want to point the way. And so we say, hey, it's okay to not be okay. We don't judge people. You come in where you are. And the good news is you don't have to stay that way in your life. God can meet you there and do a supernatural work in your life. But we don't go around judging everybody. If you want to walk in greater light with Jesus, step back from judgment. So this week, when you're tempted to judge, when you look around and see somebody that their kids are unruly and wild and you want to judge those parents or you know somebody that they were on the sobriety wagon and then they fell off and, and you want to fire away at those individuals or, or you're you know, wronged by somebody and frustrated and you want to stand in judgment over them, just step back and remember that Jesus is the light and we're to follow him and he'll work it out with his people. 
We can pray for them. We can love them. We can point the way with our lives, step back from judgment. Another thought is to step out of condemnation. Step out of condemnation. I saw this website that posted um, food mistakes that people have made in their lives. And so I thought a few of these were uh, pretty funny. Uh, One person says, I bought a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. (laughs) I parked where there was no one around and ate in silence. Well... There was some soft moaning. (laughs) All right, let's go to the next one. This person says, I told my wife I was going to the gym, but went to McDonald's instead. Come on, somebody! I waited until it seemed long enough for a workout. And when I got home, I poured water on my head and shirt to make it look like I'd been sweating. All right, one more. I once ate an entire bucket of cheese balls. And then I sat there in my orange shame, (laughs) reflecting on the choices I've made. (laughs) I think I've done that with ice cream, right? Uh, Shame is a thing, and it hangs over our lives. And shame can ultimately tie into this whole idea of feeling condemnation, like we're, we're just condemned, we're filled with shame for our actions, our past, not only for maybe what we've done, but our perception of who we are. And there's a darkness that comes with that. And part of what Jesus came to do is free us from the darkness of condemnation. Look at this, John chapter 8, beginning in verse 10, it says, then Jesus stood up and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them, what? And one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. He actually addresses this woman. The NLT doesn't really pick it up, but, but he, he calls her woman. He says, woman, where are your accusers? It was a way of showing her respect. It's how Jesus addressed his own mother in the New Testament. At one point he says, woman. <laughs> So he's already building her up. He says, where are your accusers? See, Jesus comes along and he stands between the accusers and her. And he does the same in our lives. I mean, we all have accusers, right? We all have people throughout our lives that have said maybe we're no good or or we're nothing or we'll never be anything. We'll kind of always be where we're at or you're dumb or you're silly or you're stupid or you're ugly or you're fat or you're skinny or you're tall or you're short or you're fill in the blank. And sometimes these voices just keep playing in our heads. Things people have said to us, reviews people have left online, comments think that they have said. I, I, I'll never forget, um, I had a friend, he, he spoke one weekend at Central years ago, and, and uh, afterwards he called me like middle of the week. He goes, Judd, you know that the message goes up on YouTube. I'm like, yeah. He goes, man, somebody left a terrible comment. I said, oh man, you you haven't been doing this very long, have you? (laughs) It's it's just part of it, right? I said, what do they say? He tells me the comment. I'm like, oh, you'll be all right, man. Just don't don't look at that stuff. And I'm like, just don't. And he's like, like, how do do you just ignore it? I said, let let me tell you some stories. I started going down my greatest hits. We we had a guy once come to church. He goes, man, I just need to say I'm sorry. I've never met you, but I went to all these websites, impersonated different people, and left horrible reviews about him. Thank you for telling me that. I appreciate that. I mean, it goes on and on. But here's what I would say. You can't let what others say about you drive all of your thinking and your process because you're giving them too much power in your life. Somebody leaves a bad review, okay, if you can learn from that, learn from it. Otherwise, tune it out and move on because every time you think about it and give it mental energy and give it your attention, you're giving them power over your life. Some of you have an ex who just keeps talking stuff about you. Am I in anybody's world right now? And you know stuff's flying. But listen, the longer you give that attention, the more you give them continued power in in your life. And sometimes you just got to turn that light off and shut that door and say, you're not, you can say, you want to stay in that cycle of bitterness? God bless you. But I'm not going to live there anymore. I'm moving on and I'm following Jesus into 
the light. I'm going to step out of condemnation. Jesus went to the cross and died so that you and I could be forgiven and free. He says you are forgiven when you place your faith and trust in him. He places his stamp of approval over your life. The Bible says you are righteous. You are a priest. You are uh, literally um, on your way. You're an heir of, of, of heaven. And as you follow Christ in your life and as you trust him, you got to hang on to what he says about you more than what other people say about you. If you live long enough, somebody's going to vilify you. So what are you going to do with it? Don't let it rule your life. Let Jesus rule your life. John chapter 8, verse 11, this woman standing there, Jesus says he doesn't condemn her. And then he says this, go and what? Sin no more. Don't stop there. Go and sin. Cool. No more. Go and sin no more. Now, some people look at this part of the story and kind of ramp back up and go into judgment mode and forget what the whole rest of the story was about and are like, yeah, see, our job is to tell people to go and sin no more. You missed the point of the story, bro. Go and sin no more is an invitation to a better life. It's not an invitation to go judge everybody around you. It's an invitation for you, for me, to a better life. And if you will go and sin no more, in other words, if you'll start getting honest about your own anger, your own bitterness, your own issues, your own habits, your own sin, your own sexual past, your own uh, 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 temper and how it expresses itself, how you love people, how you serve, if you'll start getting honest about those things in your life, then you'll start walking more and more in the light. And that is an opportunity to have a greater life because right after this, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world and everyone who follows follows me will no longer stumble in darkness. And basically you will have the light that leads to life. So you can stumble in the darkness of judgment, or you can stumble in the darkness of condemnation and sin. But Jesus is saying there is a path here, a light that's available to all of us if you will follow me. So maybe somebody's here today and you carry the shame of some sexual behavior that, that you're not proud of. And you've been told your whole life that that makes you dirty, that that makes you unlovable. And Jesus comes along and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Or maybe you're here today and you've made a lot of money mistakes in the past and some things you're really ashamed of and you think God can never bless you. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Maybe you struggle with so much emotional issues like anger, anxiety, depression. It, it, it blows up your relationships. It, it makes you feel like you're damaged goods and that you don't deserve anything better than what you have. But Jesus says, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Maybe ever since you were young, you've dealt with a negative self-image. Maybe you've always felt like you're not worthy of love or attention. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. If you are stuck in the darkness of shame, Jesus will see you and he will hear you and he will help you. He'll heal you and he'll love you and he'll lead you. But he does not condemn you. Because that's not why he came. Jesus himself said so five chapters earlier in John 3, 17. He said, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus doesn't come to agree with your accusers. He comes to silence them. And he speaks over her life and over our lives. I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. So today... As we head into a new week, this is an opportunity for us. This week, when you're tempted to judge others or pick up your stone, just remember all that God has done in your life. Be thankful for what he's done in your life and realize God's going to do a work in their life in his own time and his own way and put down your stone and let him work. Or maybe for you, it's 
It's about stepping out of that condemnation. You always feel you're never good enough. You're never worthy. Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Now go, an invitation to a new life is available to you. And all you have to do is follow him. He's the life. He's the light that leads to life. Trust him in your life. Maybe you're here and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith and I'd love to give you that opportunity. If God's been moving in your heart and life, if he's been tapping you on the shoulder, I want to challenge you to come home to him and repeat a simple prayer after me. It's, it's not the end of your spiritual journey. It's really just the beginning. It's a simple way to open your heart to God and place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus today, you can begin that journey by repeating after me either out loud or just in your own heart. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me just to say before God and to say to me, you're going to follow him. You're going to trust him in your life. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Just reach out to him today. Thank you. Bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. God, I just pray for each one of these individuals just reaching out to you, and I pray you'll fill them with your love, your peace, your joy, your forgiveness, your spirit. Guide them and walk with them, and we celebrate them right now. In Christ's name, amen. Well, let's put our hands together for each of these individuals that made spiritual commitments in their life today. I'm going to ask you to remain seated for just a moment. If you made a spiritual commitment, I want to encourage you to go out to our next step area in the lobby. Let them know you made a spiritual commitment. We'd love to give you a journal called Follow Him and answer any questions you may have. You can also, if you're watching online, go to central.family and just click the link, I've decided to follow Jesus. Would all of you stand together with me now? Let's put our hands together for Pastor Nick, who's got a few final thoughts. Well, thank you, Pastor Judd, for that incredible message of hope. If you made that decision today, head over to central.family. Click on that button that says, I decided to follow Jesus, and we will send you those resources to help you along on your journey. Well, family, also, you know, we love when you have those watch parties. We love when you take those pictures, and when you tag us, Use the hashtag watch party and then tag Central Online. We love to see those. And as you go throughout this week, I want you to hang on to Romans 8 that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up. <laughs>